Amen, amen. I am so excited to uh, introduce our guest speaker today. Our guest speaker is uh, Pastor Nathan Barnett. <laughs> Pastor Nathan Barnett is my father-in-law. Pastor Barnett has been the senior pastor of three churches. Uh, he was the pastor at a church in Portland by the name of Berean. And he was a pastor at two churches in Seattle, one by the name of Dunlap and the other by the name of Dynamic Christian Living Fellowship. Uh, pastor Barnett went to a seminary school with Pastor Carl. And so they graduated just a few years apart. Um, it's such an honor for me today to have my father-in-law speak. Uh, it was 15 years ago when I preached my first sermon. And the first sermon that I ever preached in my life on Sunday was at his church. And so over all these years, uh, he has discipled me and mentored me where now I'm so honored to give my father-in-law an opportunity to preach. So please give a big round of applause to Pastor Nathan Barnett. Thanks, Mary. Good morning, saints. Happy Father's Day to you wonderful men, you look so good today. And it is a blessing to have a son-in-law like her. I, I say that heartfelt, to see a young man that I didn't know when I first met him that he would become a part of our family. I want to say as well concerning his dad, who's gone to be on with the Lord, uh, he was a wonderful man. And I miss Herb the second greatly, but he didn't get the chance to see his father, his son, stand in the, in the pulpit, but he had a lot of love and hope as her went to college, went to seminary, and he changed his life course to become a pastor, and, and I just love for what God is doing in Herb's life and in this ministry. Uh, I want to say as well that since I've come in closer relationship with the Antioch Baptist Church, that Pastor Herb and, and Pastor Al and Pastor Carl and, and Pastor Mark, these men uh, has been remarkable. Um, I accepted Jesus Christ in 1969 uh, as a 17-year-old teenager, uh, and I've, I'm just blessed to meet these men at this part in my life and going to Bible college and seminary with with uh, Dr. Payne. Uh, I never knew I would call him doctor one day. He was just a, a loud-spoken kid in those days. Uh, Carl kept everybody on their toes. Pastor Herb asked me to preach on the subject of the real church. Uh, we're following up real hope, and people with real hope needs a real church that they can live out their faith in. Uh, I would like to take the liberty, Pastor Herb, of going on to the subject of not just real, but authentic. And the authentic means that you resemble the original one. And that is the goal that Jesus had in mind. And the Bible was written, and the Gospels were written, and the epistles and the history books was written that we might follow the pattern that was set by our Savior and set by the early Christians. We've struggled to do that, but with the Word of God and through God's faithfulness to us, we want to be a real biblical church or an authentic biblical church. And so I've chosen to speak to us this morning from 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 16. Paul says, I hope to come to you soon but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, 
a pillar and buttress of truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Amen goes right there. Amen goes right there. Amen. Paul has breaking all. I mean, it's like he's so excited. If I could see Paul there, he jumped up and he shouted this hymn of praise as he was writing in the middle of writing to this young man about his concerns that the church would lose its authenticity and would drift off into another venue. Paul wrote this church. And so Pastor Herb asked me to preach on this. And when you talk about the subject of a real church, it can be a very broad subject. So let's look biblically what the real church means. First of all, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is believed and held on to that by all Christians that this is the first mention of the church that Jesus had in mind as the universal church, a church that is seen in the spirit and known of God. Jesus says, I'm doing something that when I'm gone, Peter, and you disciples, I'm going to build through your lives my church. Now, I want to give you two points on this. First of all, when I look and try to identify where a church is going, my first question I ask, who does it belong to? Jesus says, it's my church. Pastor, it's not your church. It's his church. He's made you the overseer. He's made you, but it's his church. And he's going to do, and it should be done, what he wants us to do. And I always think about it. Jesus said, this is my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, time, so many often, Pastor Herb, you see who the church belongs to, and you get a sense in your stomach that, I don't know if they see that they belong to Jesus. The second thing he says about the universal church, that this church, the gates of hell shall not overcome it. And that is that it shall last forever. Jesus is saying that he has providentially and he promises that we who are part of his church will one day join with him. It is believed of Bible scholars that this word gates of hell means death. In other words, when we're gone, when we leave this place, we go on and continue and we shall join that eternal, everlasting group that has surrounded Jesus and say, we're his church. So the universal church. But secondly, I want to read to you Ephesians 1, 1 and 2. And Paul writes, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, after the church began in Acts chapter 2 with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, we saw the first Christ church there in Jerusalem. And as you know, this church began to spread throughout Asia Minor and throughout all the world. And so the apostles wrote letters to local churches. These local churches are made up of individuals who are part of the universal church. The thing we have to remember about the universal church is found in 2 Timothy 2.19, where Paul says, But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal, the Lord knows those who are his own. A pastor can say, well, well those are my people. Those, so-and-so is saved. So-and-so is a Christian. But Paul goes further than that. Paul says, the Lord knows. He knows even when we don't know. 
He knows when we're discouraged. He knows when things are not going well and we have doubts in our mind. The Lord says, you belong to me. I purchase you. I save you with my son's blood. You are mine and you are part of a great communion of saints who are part of the eternal church, of, of the universal church, which expresses itself in local individuals. And my beloved friends, this church is spread throughout all the world and almost every continent. We see Christ's church that he promised being planted and taking root and growing. So I want to encourage us as we think about this subject of the real, authentic, biblical church. What does that mean? And Paul is writing to Timothy because he's concerned about this church. He's concerned, in, and in Acts 28, we see that the Apostle Paul has been taken to Rome. He's been locked up, but he has a freedom, and people are coming and going. Christian history tells us that it wasn't long after this that Paul will be released again, but then Paul will be rearrested and he'll be martyred by Nero. Paul knows that, that there's an urgency. There's an urgency to his life. And his personality, if, if you study the life of Paul, you'll see that Paul was just a person, he was a man of purpose and decision and action. And that's a marvelous trait to have. But this urgency that Paul has as he writes to Timothy right in the middle of this great book, he says, I hope to come to you soon. I don't know about you, but I can feel in that. It's like you writing to one of your children says, I want to be there and I want to be there soon. Let me be a little bit personal. I was down in North Carolina and my, I got a call that mom back in Portland wasn't doing well and they put her on the phone and I said, mom, if you just can hold on just a little bit longer, I'll be there soon. This urgency that, that we must learn to regather. During the pandemic, I sense, and as I've been praying, that the church has come into a lethargy and that we become comfortable because we haven't been coming together for worship like we had been accustomed to. We haven't had Bible study. We haven't had discipleship. We haven't seen the people being born again and missions growing. That is easy to get into this uh, 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 this sense of being, plaza, you know, just blase and not having an urgency. And Paul wasn't like that. He knew that any time the father could call him, call him home. So he writes to Timothy and says, I hope to come to you soon, but in case I don't get there, let me write this to you, Timothy. I want to say to us, my friends, that Paul was concerned about a adding on to the gospel message. The, the enemy Satan's tactic is, is to try to destroy the church, but if he can't destroy it, he adds on to it. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, 4. He says, I, as I urge you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may teach, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than stewardship from God that is faith, that is in by faith. Speculation. The church can easily drift into speculative living and not be a church that is based upon the biblical word of God and trusting God to accomplish his will. This just added on. We're living in a day and age today, my friends, when deceptions to the true church, to the authentic church, are real and they're alive today. And they seek to draw us away from the real Christ, the real church, the real faith. Just this, just this week, I sat down on a man at uh, SeaTac Airport, and I was saying to him, hey, I'm preaching this weekend. 
And he said to me, I said, I'd love for you to come. And he says, you know, Nathan, uh, don't get me wrong. I believe the Bible and, and I've gone to church, but I see so much in the church. I, I see the lives and the scandals of the pastors. And I see how the church has taken on all these false things and these uh, various things. And Nathan, I, I just, I just don't can bring myself to go to church anymore. And I just hung my head and I prayed and I said, you know, you're right. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And pray for me because I wish to have a continuing conversation. But this is happening over and over again because we lose our urgency of the church and keeping true to his purpose and his call people will drift away. People will move into false churches and they won't know what the real church looks like. And Paul was concerned about this. So I want to talk to us today and I want us to recommit ourselves to God today. Let me tell you what my goal is outright today. My goal is that we all will recommit ourselves to being God's authentic biblical church and that we can be better. Amen? Amen. Now I want to say something that I, I skipped over a little bit, but I think this is important. First of all, authentic church believes that it's Christ's church. It's Christ's church. And we respect it to that. Secondly, we know that when we live this life, we should live. But when Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he says, to the, to the saints in Ephesus who are faithful. That's one of my goals this morning, that Nathan Barnett will be more faithful. I know sometimes I like to say, am I faithful? I can be more, Lord. And I ask you to help me to truly be faithful. Faithful, not according to my standards, but faithful according to God, to be a faithful believer that measures up to what God is calling me to be. Secondly, when Paul wrote to these Christians at Ephesus, he says, my desire for your life is that when people see you, when people walk into the doors of Antioch, they will sense the living God and they will sense God's mercy, God's grace, God's mercy, and God's peace. Then you know I'm in an authentic church. I can see God's grace on the faces of people. I can see his mercy. I can see him moving and living in the church. So what does this church look like? First of all, it is important. Paul is writing, he says, Timothy, I want to get here and I want to get there fast because I don't want anything to happen to that group of people there in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul said this a few years earlier to the church at Ephesus. Listen to what he says. Pay careful attention to yourselves. Now he's writing to the elders, or he's talking to the elders, he's giving a farewell speech, but I want us to apply that to us. Christian, pay careful attention to yourself. Take, take your eyes off pastor. Take your eyes off the, the structure. Pay careful attention to yourself. And to all, pay attention to all the flock so pay attention to yourself and pay attention to your brothers and sisters in Christ. That you, some you know by name, some you know by face. Pay attention in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care, to care for, to care about the church of God. Then he puts this part on that just goes to the heart, which he obtained by his own blood. Paul is saying the church is important. It is of the highest level because Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, he could have gotten out of it, friends. 
He could have said to the father, Father, you know, um, they've had a good example. I've given them your word and I showed them how to love and how to give and how to do all these great things. Maybe that's enough here. And I've got these disciples. They can tell others how good of a God you are. No, he decided that night, even though it was a struggle, not my will, but thy be, will be done, to go all the way, to make the sacrificial offering of his blood at Calvary for our sins. For Paul says there can be no forgiveness of sins except through Christ. That tells me if this is the only way, if this is the only gospel, then we need to keep it authentic and we need to stay uh, true to it. But not only with that, because it's important, there's an urgency. There's an urgency about it. And I, I know when my son-in-law was talking about everybody, we're going to try to see an increase in attendance. We're going to flip the Northwest for Jesus Christ. And I thought, hmm. But then I, th I read this passage. God has put in this church and the elders an urgency that the church is so important. Its mission, its purpose, and it is the only way that men and women to have a message that they can enter into the kingdom of God. We need that kind of urgency. Amen, amen goes right there. We need an urgency about our lives. An urgency is if you were to get on your phone and get a text message from your bank and it said, oh, by the way, money is being drafted out of your account at $1,000 a minute. I'd say I'd be pretty urgent about that. Souls are being lost. Satan depends on our lethargy. Satan depends that we will not be urgent for the gospel. He depends on that we will not be urgent about sharing Jesus Christ. He, he depends on the fact that in this day where people are getting their message out and we're not getting our message out. We're living a day of body art. People have messages. And I work at SeaTac Airport as a bivocational pastor for many years, and I noticed that they had tattoos, and everybody had their tattoos. At first, TSA wouldn't let them wear them, but they broke down and said, well, you can wear your tattoo. And I got to thinking about that. They're getting their message out. Why can't I get my message out? Amen. And so I put a cross, a lapel tie cross on my shirt, whether I'm wearing a tie or not. And the Lord has opened up an urgency that when people have said things to me, and, and sometimes they don't like getting screened, and I says, listen. And I point to the message on the cross, and I say, do you know what this cross means? It means to you, my friend, that I'm coming to you as a messenger of Jesus Christ, and I would never screen you or treat you any other way, and I want you to know that. We need an emergency. I don't know what your urgency is. If they were to walk into your homes, what they see, as for me and my house, we love, we, we will serve the Lord. Or on your t-shirt, are you willing to say, Jesus is my Lord? What's your sense of urgency? What's our sense of urgency? The church is important because it has the message, and Paul did not want it to be. He is the only message of Reconciliation. Secondly, Paul says something twice. He says, we are God's household and the church of the living God. Now, he had written to the uh, Timothy to make sure the elders and the deacons are taking care of their households. Make sure that they're organized and they're administrating and their households are are fulfilling their purposes. And then the Holy Spirit led him to say, you know, Paul, even though your elders and your deacons have a household, God has a household. And it's important that you, as their leader, that God's household will reflect the purposes for which God created it. You know, every home has a purpose. Every household has a reason why it exists, to show love, to show 
God's creation and building a family to spreading God's wealth and God's love throughout the world. Well, this household has a purpose. When I talk to people, I often, they, they say to me, well, why should I go to church? And I say, well, but that's where you can interact with God's people. And when I think about when people say, well, what church, Nathan, should I join? What should I be looking for? Let me give you some reasons, I think, biblically that can help us with that. First of all, Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. And then earlier in that book, Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. Jesus says that is the highest level. People will see that the love that flows through you is a, a spiritual love that comes from heaven. It's a powerful love that comes directly through Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, and it flows out to one another. But it first has to start with as a loving Christ. Jesus says, if you love me, you obey me. If you love me, you will organize and live your life out of love and reverence for me. That's the first thing I look in the church. I ask, do they really love Jesus? I mean, do they talk about him or do they talk about a lot of other stuff? You know, a person that you truly love, don't you talk about them? Don't you brag on them? Yes, you're looking for a church where the pastors and the members, they just love. I mean, uh, they used to have a thing where if you could go in a church and nobody spoke to you before you left, that's not a good church. And you don't have to program that kind of thing. You just, just something inside of you to say, there's someone I've never seen before. Let me touch them with love. So I look for love. Jesus says that if you're my disciples, people are going to know it because you will be expressing my love for one another and you will be living in obedience to my love. The second thing I look for in an authentic church is holiness. In Luke 640, the Lord said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Jesus says, as we are discipled and grow, that more and more his truths will begin to transform us so that we respond and live the way he lived. With the Heavenly Father's will and purpose being the highest on our list. We will treat people the way Jesus treated people. For instance, the, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, or a story about a disobedient son who ran away and wasted his father's inheritance. We'll respond to the world because that's the way our Savior responds. He says, true churches act as their Savior acted. When I look at the ministries that have gone out through Antioch Bible Church to homeless people, to people struggling, needing services, people who are born with no father and mother that wanted them, I say, they're demonstrating Christ-like holiness. Holiness simply means a life that is set apart to be used of and by God. I look for a church that that permeates their ministry. Third thing I look for is dedication to the Lord. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1, 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He also said in Galatians 2, 20, 21, he says, for I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me in the life I need. Now live by faith. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I believe that 
God had Paul to write these things so that we would know what a devoted life to Christ looked like. Think about it. This man who hated Jesus Christ, this man who hated the church, this man who hated other Christians, when God flipped his life, all he wanted to do is be like Jesus. The second thing I want to say to you is the church is to be a church that's alive. And when I say that, I'm not talking about empty emotionalism. I'm talking about a church where the Bible is believed. I'm talking about where the truth of grace is seen, power to go through trials, powers to suffer loss, powers to be hurt by people, but the grace of God hangs in me and keeps me true. I'm thinking about peace when you lost a loved one. I'm talking about peace when things haven't gone your way. I'm talking about peace when your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ have let you down. That is a display of the life of God flowing through the Holy Spirit that impacts a church. I'm talking about when we gather today, there's an anticipation not only to meet our friends, but to meet with the living God. And he pours out a new and fresh raising up of Jesus Christ and love for him and love for people and lost love for lost people throughout the world. That's a living church. An idol can do nothing for you. You can have an idol as a car and you can pray to that car and wash that car, but that car cannot be with you when death comes. The living God, the Ephesians, they had Diana was the main culprit there, the main idol, and they made a lot of money off of her. But when Jesus Christ came in, people turned from a dead God to the living God. I want to ask this this morning. Is your God alive? Amen. Someone said one day, well, I know God is alive because I just talked to him this morning. We went through the God is dead conspiracy. Can you imagine that? People saying to Christians, your God is dead? He's not dead, friends. He's not dead in my life. Now, since 1969, he's been a living Savior. Someone asked John Perkins one day, a fiery brand for God. Some of you know who John Perkins is. They say, John, you're excited now. What would it be like when you grow old to John? Will you lose your excitement for Christ? Well, John, John Perkins is 101, and he hasn't slowed down because he worships a living God. The third thing I want to say to us moving quickly is that the authentic, real biblical church, God has placed upon us the responsibility to hold up the gospel and proclaim his message throughout the world. Paul says the church which is of the living God, a pillar and the buttress of truth. Thank God for uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. Thank God for inner varsity. Thank God for other Christian ministries. But the main instrument that lifts up the gospel is us. Not just pastors, not elders and deacons, but you when you go to that job and you see people around you, do you realize you may be the only Christian that they get that close to? And one day, you will be taken away from them. There must be an urgency. Let me give you Martin Luther, the great reformer, who in April the 2nd, 1521 at the Imperial Diet of Worms. Martin Luther had got himself in trouble as one of the priests of the Catholic Church and wrote the 95 Theses because the, the Pope and the church needed to raise a lot of money to build some new buildings and fix some buildings. And Martin Luther wrote against the indulgence and, he, and so they called him on the carpet 
And they called him to the imperial diet of worms. And Martin Luther said this, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and the councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot, I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is not right or safe. God help me. I want us to end this, this service today saying, God help me that I will stand as an authentic, real Christian. I know you failed. I know you've fallen on your face. I know you have some things you wish you hadn't said or done. But you can come to God today and say, Lord, I'm coming back to you. I want to be a part of the real church. I want to be a part of authentic Christianity. I want you to get the glory out of my life. I want to hold up and let your truths rest as I go into the world and as I serve as a part of a biblical church. Can you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for what you started many years ago when you planted a church through Pastor Hutch and those leaders back then. And they took a stand to say, we will not, we cannot compromise God's word. Take us first, Lord, that we would fail you. Father, we stand in that vein. I pray for Pastor Herb and Leela and the elders, and their wives, and the people that they don't let go. They'll never let go of being a true, biblical, believing, acting church. Because we want you to get the glory. And we want you to say, when we enter into your kingdom, it was tough. It was hard. You were discouraged. You cried. You almost gave up. But well done, my good and faithful child. Enter into thy kingdom of your blessed Savior, Lord. Amen. Well, Antioch, I know God is alive here. Amen? I know God is doing exciting things in our church and in your life. And I'm just so blessed to be a part of it. You have a great Father's Day. Enjoy your root beer floats. You are dismissed.